Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I guess before I get started, I just want to acknowledge uh, Elliot has put in a ridiculous amount of work for this. And uh, on behalf of me, who didn't have to do nearly as much, I sincerely thank you. Uh, so I'll be calling you when I need future events planned. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Rob Falk. I um, have taken over uh, duties as the uh, development team uh, leader for OpenMDO. I don't like to call myself the lead developer because the other developers are far more skilled at that than me. I just try to steer things in the right direction. Um, my development team uh, is uh, John Yasa, who we brought on this year. He's doing an amazing job. Uh, Tad Collar, who uh, for any of you who uh, appreciate the fact that we have the N2 diagram and things like that, uh, Tad is, uh, Tad is responsible for that. Uh, Ken Moore and Brett Naylor um, are kind of the, know the fundamental guts of OpenMDO uh, better than anyone. Uh, Kashik Panapali is helping me with Dymos. Uh, and uh, Steve Ryan uh, is kind of uh, the unsung, un, unsung hero of uh, who uh, just basically takes care of business when uh, things are, are slipping through the cracks and, and uh, I'm slacking, so uh, Steve's amazing. And then, and then Herb is also just an amazing developer who uh, provides uh, a lot of our uh, convenience functionality to our users. <clears throat> so one of the things I kind of try to track is how good of a job are we doing in the community? Um, and it's difficult to assess. A lot of people who use our codes are at uh, private enterprise, and they don't like to talk about what they're doing. They don't necessarily publish. Um, still trying to track citations uh, that we're getting, the number of citations per year, or things like uh, even stars on, on GitHub. It's, we, we don't track, oh, hey, this computer is running OpenMDO, and, and send that information back to us. So. Uh, trying things like stars on, on GitHub is, is one of the metrics that we can use. But at the end of the day, this is all stuff that we on the development team we call fake internet points. It doesn't really matter. But it does try to hopefully give a gen, uh, general trend line of the way things are going. Um, so down at the bottom there, that, that red line, it's kind of the, the stars accumulated on GitHub by OpenMDA over the years. So we're on a, a, a good upward trajectory. Uh, blue is Dymos that started a little bit later and uh, is also uh, consistently on the rise. Um, so uh, I feel like we're, we're still making an impact. I also feel like we've kind of reached a relative steady state. And while we are adding capability, a lot of our core capability is there now. Um, and things are less hectic. Uh, we don't have any planned changes like uh, the, the one to two change that everyone was thrilled by. Um, so things that we've been working on recently. Um, I, th I think one of the things that I've been really paying attention to is lowering the barrier uh, to entry to, to using OpenMDAO. Um, one of those things, uh, I guess, three, three points uh, that go along with that of our change to the executable documentation, where we rewrote the documentation uh, to be based in Jupyter. Um, and as part of that, uh, it's a little easier for users just to click on something online and, and kind of experiment with it and, and play with it without having to install OpenMDO on their local systems. Uh, what John will talk about in a little bit, his practical MDO course. Uh, so John is our, our team YouTuber. My kids are very excited that I know a YouTuber. Uh, <laughs> um, and so he's been doing a great job putting together that class. And then uh, kind of on another side, um, build pi up sparse that I'll talk about here in a moment. Um, MDO lab at the University of Michigan has a great tool in pi up sparse. And we are just uh, tried to, to make it as easy as, as possible for, uh, for users uh, to get access to. If this face is involved, it's just, there's only so much I can do. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Um, all right. Wait, sorry. Uh, so let's see. So we um, 
executable documentation, our documentation is now based on uh, the Jupyter book package, which um, has been good in a lot of ways. It's also been a pain in a lot of ways, as the developers will attest to. Um, it's nice that we can write our documentation as notebooks. It's easy to test in our CI process, which is one of the reasons I like it. Uh, our previous implementation that used Sphinx, we had all kinds of, of custom hooks and things in there uh, patched in in order to, to make it work in our CI process. We had a lot of code in our actual code base, um, uh, a lot of tests that were really documentation issues. And I, for me personally, I, I like the split to, to Jupyter Book and kind of separate those two. Uh, I know our developers will attest to the fact that sometimes Jupyter Book lags or um, breaks from time to time on CI and it's like, oh, we need to patch this and, and something something made it through their process that, that shouldn't have. Um, but I, I think things have been relatively stable lately. Um, there's also a, a slight issue with, you know, Jupyter Book can run your notebooks on external services, one of which is Jupyter, or is uh, Google's Colab, which while an amazing service, I don't necessarily have faith that Google will keep their, their uh, things around forever. They don't have a great track record of doing that. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Um, uh, but yeah. Uh, so the practical uh, MDO course, like I said, uh, John Yasa has, has joined us and uh, by using uh, tools like Manum and, and presenting from his home studio, he's built some amazing uh, videos on YouTube. One of the things that we are really trying to do is get people higher bandwidth training than we could provide with our documentation. And there's only so much you can convey through, through documents and uh, you know, through static documents and, 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 and graphics. So John's done a great job of, of kind of explaining where some of the, the theory behind what we do comes from. Uh, and then, uh, so we're doing that right now and I hope in the future we'll expand that to our other tools like Dymos. Uh, so build PyOp Sparse. Um, like I said, MDO Lab provides a fantastic tool in the form of PyOp Sparse that uh, gives us access to SNOP that I know we like here at NASA, but that is also very expensive uh, for, for non-government entities, uh, which is where IPOPT comes in. IPOPT, in my experience, has been about as capable as SNOPT and, and better in, in for some problems. And then also PyOpt, uh, which I know several people are using. So things are going great there. I know uh, and I, I look forward to, to talking to some of the MDA lab folks about this because they've been going through and re refactoring their build process. Uh, so going forward, I don't know how, how necessary build PyOps Sparse uh, will be. But basically the point of this tool, um, for those of you who haven't used it, is basically to be able to, to download and install all the, uh, the dependencies that IPOPT has on uh, software like uh, linear solvers like mumps and, and things like that, that uh, your average user might have difficulty com building and compiling on their system. And uh, just being able to, to get everything up and running uh, has helped us a lot. <clears throat> uh, so kind of the, the second topic to, that I'm going to address today is the notion of uh, reducing user pain and you are all here because you use OpenMDO, which means that you have a fairly high tolerance to pain as a user, and we appreciate it. Um, we try to do things that, that are world class uh, that, that other software can't do, and because of that, we, we've put a lot of effort into, into the technical capability, and then when it comes to doing, uh, you know, to interacting with the code, when things go wrong, it's not necessarily easy uh, to, to debug and to figure out what's going on. So. Uh, we're trying, we're trying our, our best to make things work well there. Um, so three points uh, that we've tried to uh, approach this with there are the report system, with visualization tools, and with performance improvements. Um, so when it comes to report generation, um, I think on the right side there, uh, more or less verbatim of, of some conversations I've had with people of like, you know, something's not right with my model, 
oh, well, what does your N2 diagram look like? Well, how do I make my N2 diagram? And, and it's just, people don't know, you know, uh, without, when they know to look for it in the documentation, it's not hard to find, but they just don't know that's available to them. Um, and then also on the optimization side, you know, my optimization's not w working right, what's going on? Well, well how, what does your scaling look like? Have you looked at the scaling report? And it was like, well, how do I make the scaling report? Um, so I, I think the real, the real idea be behind these is that, you know, by default, I would prefer that, that users, especially naive users, got that information for free, more or less. Um, it's really cheap to generate the N2 report. It's really cheap to generate the scaling report. We should just be doing it by default unless uh, somebody tells us not to. Um, so we've, we have several reports we put in there, um, and we're trying to make them all uh, non-ASCII based. I think, I think as, uh, you know, uh, government software tends to have a, a track record of, you know, it's like, well, here, I, I gave you this ASCII printout of, you know, 50 pages. Surely you can find what you need in there. But in the age where everybody's got a capable web browser and, and D3 is a thing, we should be able to use uh, uh, rich HTML formats and other formats like that to get users um, better information. So this is just a list of the reports that we support uh, currently. So we have the scaling report, um, uh, the optimization report, um, uh, a connections report, total coloring, uh, the N2 diagram that pretty much everybody knows about, a checks report and a summary, and then also we've just recently added uh, an inputs report that I'll, I'll talk about here shortly. So this one probably needs no introduction, but everybody praises it, so I thought I'd throw it in here. Uh, the N2 diagram is just a really good way of vis visualizing your model and trying to see, hey, you know, is, is something not connected the way I think it should be connected? Uh, and so uh, these are all, like I said, this just comes with, with the fact that you call run model now, you, f you automatically get uh, an N2 report. The scaling report is something uh, that I find myself using a lot in optimization, especially in a tool like Dimos, where your, uh, your physics, your, your, the accuracy of your model is, is imposed by constraints at the optimizer. You can get unwanted interplay sometimes between optimization reports, uh, essentially your, your, your uh, you know, am I actually meeting physics and is the optimizer willing to not meet physics in order to satisfy some of my other constraints like boundary constraints and path constraints. The scaling report helps you look at things and make sure that, you know, at least to get an initial sense of is the optimizer seeing everything the way I think the optimizer should be seeing everything. Uh, the optimizer report uh, is more or less came out of the fact that, that you know, that summary that comes up at the end of, of a PyOps sparse run where, hey, let's, let's look at every, every variable and every, you know, every variable and every constraint and see what's meeting bounds and see what's not meeting bounds. Uh, the optimization report is just an attempt uh, to get that in a more rich format uh, to, to hopefully provide the user um, uh, some, in, you know, in some cases, some graphical feedback on is something not being met and, and hopefully calling the, the user's attention to something when, when something doesn't go right. Uh, the total coloring report, I am a huge fan of this one. I'm, I'm in the process of working on a project right now where this is basically helping me debug my system and, and see where I, I broke my sparsity pattern. Um, as, as the Dimos developer and, and, and the Dimos user, anything that you put in your model that breaks your sparsity just wreaks havoc with the, with the performance. And uh, the total coloring report really lets me go in and see, oh, you know, here's a dense block. Some, some dense calculation is going on in there, and, and it's kind of my, my first step into to, uh, debugging and figuring out, you know, what did I mess up and provide uh, dense uh, derivatives to on accident. Uh, and then our newest report, the, the inputs report. Uh, so it's been coming up uh, kind of frequently lately of I have a very complex model in OpenMDAO, one that may or may not use really complex uh, DIMO systems on, on, under the hood. Uh, 
I need to know what the ultimate inputs that the user is responsible for are. If we do list inputs, we get all of our inputs. Um, so, uh, but I, I really want to know, is something coming from an in-depth fire comp, is it uh, you know, not explicitly connected by the user, or is it explicitly connected uh, to an in-depth fire comp? That at least lets me know that this is something that the user is potentially supposed to provide. Uh, the other side of that is, uh, is, th is this output of an in-depth fire comp something uh, that the optimizer is controlling, where perhaps the initial value is on me, but eventually the, you know, the optimizer is taking over that and controlling that. And just being able to know, you know, if you're going to run this model, these are the things that you ultimately need to, uh, to worry about providing. Um, I, I feel like uh, this is a really good tool for that, and we've only, it's only been in the code base for a couple of weeks, and I've already been using it nearly every day. So it's been great for me. Uh, and then to talk about performance improvements, uh, I believe up after me is, is John Yasa, and he's going to talk about our, our vectorized uh, fixed dimension interpolants. Um, and then we've had some improvements in coloring, our cover coloring algorithms. Uh, earlier this year, we, we found some performance there that significantly sped those up. And then, um, and then also we've been uh, finding little things here and there in the code, like finding uh, cases, basically cases in the code where we're running things when we shouldn't be running things and buying bits of performance back like that. Um, just as a, as a preview of, of John's talk, this is uh, some of the improvement that we can see with our fixed dimension interpolants. So what I mean by fixed dimension is that, uh, for instance, if you use something like our meta model structured comp, uh, where you have a Lagrange 3 interpolant, um, you, can, you can add, you know, uh, Several, several dimensions to that, and, and the code will go through and will differentiate itself as needed. But a lot of the coefficients there can be, can be teased out, and, and, and Ken Moore actually went through and, and you know, uh, did, did a lot of work to pre-compute what can be pre-computed there. And we've gotten our, our run times down by, you know, orders, you know, uh, two orders of magnitude there, so it's, or at least one and a half orders of magnitude. So things have been really good there. Um, I know in the past we've supported the Fortran-based MBI interpolation tool. I don't think we see a lot of use for that, and if anybody uh, objects, I'm happy to hear uh, their, their objection, but we'll probably, uh, you know, we plan on discontinuing support for that Fortran-based MBI interpolation tool. It just, it doesn't seem like it gets used enough, and running Fortran uh, codes on systems that aren't Linux-based uh, can be problematic, as anyone with Windows or an ARM-based Mac knows. Sometimes those things get a little uh, uh, difficult to use. Ah, so talking about our future development efforts, and I'll talk more about our poems later, where where we go into some of the things that you know are currently up in our poems process. But as far as where we want to take the code. Um, We've implemented our explicit funk comp and implicit funk comp, which are basically ways of wrapping uh, previously defined functions, uh, Python functions, uh, in, in an OpenMDO component. Um, just trying to, you know, there was, there's been a lot of history of OpenMDO where it's like, oh, I have this great Python model, great, now, now write it as a component and, and do that and, you know, provide all the derivatives and everything. Uh, which certainly works, but it's also a, a big investment up front. Um, so uh, Brett Naylor Im implemented these. Um, you can use JAX to, to provide automatic differentiation of them in, in, in a lot of cases, uh, so that helps us out there. Um, I know I've been working on a project lately, uh, I'll talk about it a little bit more, uh, where, where we've been using SymPy's source code transformation as our, as our method of providing derivatives which works incredibly well. Uh, it's just, it's, it's uh, SymPy and, and, and you know, translating that into an OpenMDO component is a little bit of work still, so we're, we might look at uh, automating that for the user and saying, hey, if you, you know, wanna do things with SymPy, let's make your life a little bit easier. Um, uh, and then other possible paths, uh, I'm curious to hear opinions. I, I know some people have been using Julia, uh, uh, calling Julia from Python and, and providing derivatives that way. Uh, some of our um, uh, Aero Acoustic work is, is doing that. Uh, another, 
another thing that I would uh, that I'm worried about is is how to manage complexity, and th this still goes back to the to the user experience. But when you get a huge complex model, it's really easy to forget to promote something, and you and you think it's being connected uh, somewhere, and it's not. Um, the N2 diagram helps with this a little bit. The in, the inputs report was was designed uh, to meet this. I wonder if you know. Should we provide an easier way to provide connections? Should we should we provide some mechanism of bundling connections together and just saying you know this this signal consists of of these five output variables from various components and this entire signal in one go gets sent to these uh, components downstream? Um, a notion of a of a Simulink bus or something like that we we've, we've talked about um, and. Again, why, why we are here is to hear everybody's opinion on that matter. I guess that's, that's what I'm uh, most concerned about hearing. Uh, so a, a common interface is something else that's been coming up a lot lately. We have a few design teams who are working on similar problems who are coming up with different ways of solving, uh, you know, how, how does the user interact with my code? We, I think most of us are under the opinion that uh, for the tools that we develop based on OpenMDAO that are intended uh, for use by uh, systems analysts, we don't necessarily want them touching the Python and breaking things that way. Then you get into, okay, does this look like, you know, an input file, you know, is this, is this nameless input-esque or is it JSON, uh, you know, or YAML, uh, something like that. So I'm curious, uh, I'm really looking forward to, to talks this week and seeing if other people have ideas of this. And if that's the case, you know, should we, as OpenMDO's developers, be providing a canonical solution of, you know, this is generally what we consider the best practice uh, for doing this. I know we have uh, some ways in Jupyter of basically saying, okay, here are the inputs uh, that the user can talk to and, and let's pull up a Jupyter widget to do that but not everybody uses Jupiter, so uh, you know, other, other ways of doing that we're also looking for. Uh, another one that's come up a lot lately is the sub-problem interface. Uh, by sub-problem interface, I mean a component whose compute method is basically running a, an OpenMDO problem under the hood, and then in its you know, compute partials, it's effectively computing the totals across the underlying problem and sending that back. We've seen a, a lot of uh, performance improvement on some models if we can essentially hide the underlying model's data from, from the upper model and, and that, that provides a good mechanism of kind of reducing the complexity, reducing the number of transfers uh, that our code has to do. Um, so, uh, and there have been, been various, various cases probably over the past few months where you know, we think of more and more use cases for this. Uh, so we'll probably be uh, providing a, an enhancement proposal, a poem, on uh, what we think the best way to do uh, this is uh, relatively soon. Uh, second derivatives. Um, this one is I'm a little more biased towards as an optimal control person, but having second derivative information uh, in a lot of cases, in, in a tool like Dimos, uh, would significantly help performance. We could use a uh, full Newton method uh, if the optimizer supports it, in it uh, as opposed to a BFGS or you know, quasi-Newton method. Um, but doing this is not easy. Uh, it's basically going to require an extension uh, to the mod theory on which OpenMDO is based. So it's just going to require somebody to sit down for a few weeks probably and hash that out. And then not only, you know, that underlying theory, but also, you know, what does, what does the software architecture look like and how do we uh, make sure it happens in a way that's, that's compatible with the current framework. So with that, I am eager to hear uh, people's questions. Uh, and please don't hold back complaints. Um, I don't think they handed out the tomatoes, but if, if you have anything for me, uh, please, uh, let's hear it. Yeah. I have a microphone here for anybody that has questions or comments. I'll run around. 
Thank you. Yeah, uh, I have. Uh, I thank thank you for your uh, uh, presentation, and I'd like to ask one question regarding the uh, parallelization uh, when you are uh, making a sub problem using OpenMDAO. So, so whenever you have a larger OpenMDAO problem, and within that OpenMDAO problem, you can have like sub problem inside that. And in that case, whenever uh, I want to run parallel computing, like uh, using MPI or uh, some, some other way, then is that going to conflict? Uh, or can I, uh, uh, can I make uh, like uh, Allocate some uh, cores to sub problem while uh, allocating other cores for the uh, outer problem. Is that going to be possible or not? Uh, that is my question. Justin, you want to take that? Yeah, sorry, Rob. Uh, Rob's still dipping his toes into the MD MPI waters. Um, the answer to your question is you can do both. Uh, the, when you do a sub problem, you have to be a little careful. But OpenMDO takes in a COM at the problem level. You can pass one in. And then it subdivides it amongst groups and components. And then in the subproblem, which is embedded in a component, you have to make sure to pass that COM down into the subproblem. So it's really about being very careful with your COMs and making sure you never, ever, ever use COM world anywhere in your software. <laughs> um, but you know, the problem itself has an argument, like when you instantiate it, instantiation, right, Brett, that takes a COM. And then it will use that com and subdivide it up, and then you can keep passing that down through all the layers. So as long as you're a little careful with com management, you can do what you've asked about. Thank you. Rob, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about the automatic differentiation uh, tools that you mentioned here, the uh, and how they're integrated in uh, OpenMDAO. The, um, so here you mentioned um, Jax and SymPy. Mm -hmm. So how so, how deep are those? Just tools you can add. On? Like can I can I come with like PyTorch or other kind of AD tools? Or I think right now our explicit function comp and imp implicit function comp are kind of tailored to look for Jax if it's available. Right? That that's right, Brett. Right. Um, so we would need to to essentially add capability to say, okay, if you wanna, if you wanna bring a different tool, uh, we'll need to make a case for that, you know, you make, embed that capability, but there's no, I don't see a reason why it wouldn't be possible. Um, that's your, is that your go-to right now is PyTorch? I'm not, um, no, not necessarily. Okay, <laughs> okay. but yeah. It's just there's lots of, there's lots of tools out there and, and none of them are always are great <laughs> are great yeah yeah no I I understand and, and this this is definitely something that's like holding back the second derivatives work because doing first derivatives manually is a pain like doing second derivatives is just uh, masochistic so um, <laughs> uh, I, I think I think it's open. I mean, I, I think you know, wrapping Julia or, or something in there and, and, and calling out to Julia and asking Julia to do it is something that other people have looked at. So just I, we're we're in the mode where we're we're searching talking for the what mic. the right answer is. Make sure you're talking into the mic. Sorry, I think we're just in the mode where we're searching for what the right answer is. I I think the answer is there is no right answer. Um, if you're interested in AD, you should please please check out the functional interface. Can you? Maybe flip back to that slide real quick, but um, we wrote that specifically to make OpenMDO easier to use AD with. Uh, AD basically wants a function to differentiate, and so this is what we're, we're sort of giving you. There's other ways you can integrate AD, but I think to Graham's point, we're not choosing an AD framework. Uh, the best one in Python we've played with is Jax. Um, I'll be blunt, if I'm personally gonna do AD stuff, I probably will use Julia. I think the AD integration into Julia is really, really excellent. Um, and we have some good tools for making Julia talk to Python, but depending on your environment and how willing you are to s take the extra steps to install Julia, that may not, may not be an option for you. Um, if you're gonna make a heavy investment in AD, I, I think it's probably worth it, in my opinion. Um, and then I think Jax might be a, a second, my second option. Um, but yeah, that's, I, I think that the answer is OpenMDO doesn't choose an AD system, it doesn't preference one. Um, that functional API was kind of our first step toward trying to make it easier to use AD. There are other ways you could do it too. And, and honestly, I, I think these days, if we have 
if we have a model that, that's compatible with it, um, complex step is our, especially now that we support uh, coloring the derivatives of complex step stuff automatically, it's, that's sort of the go-to, you know, before I feel like diving in and, and defining things analytically, I'll just start with complex step and that usually offers performance that's acceptable. If you're coding in Python and OpenMDO natively and you haven't tried complex step, you should try complex step. That's yeah. the, the easiest way to dip your toe into AD without actually knowing anything about it and you'll get better derivatives and hopefully faster optimizations. While you guys think of your next question for Rob, I, I would like a, just a show of hands. How many of you found out that there was a report that you didn't know about? I'm just curious. And even, even folks on the OpenMDO team raised their hands to that one. So, I mean, presentation worthwhile, but one of the things we'd be looking for feedback on would be like ways that we can make this stuff easier for you to discover. Obviously, we're trying to generate some of those reports more automatically, so now you know to go look in that folder and discover some, but um, one of the challenges with OpenMDO is there's so much capability, sometimes it's hard for users to discover it all. So any input you guys have is, is welcome there. Hi, this is Adil from Enron. Uh, first of all, uh, I mean, my experience with OpenMDO has been really nice. Uh, I don't know what open source tools you've been working with. Uh, I mean, I've had a terrible, terrible time with them, but with OpenMDO, I've, I've really loved working with it. Uh, one suggestion I have is, 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 the, is the reports that you have, instead of having them in multiple HTML files, if you, if you could all put them all into one and have tabs there, I think that would be much easier to pop parse through them. Okay. I don't understand. You don't like folders and paging through endless files? I'm, I'm confused. No, that, that's actually a really good note we can, we can look into. Yeah. That. Uh, just a quick mention here. We, we do have a, it's, it's kind of crude, but we do have a, a command line thing where you can say uh, open MDAO view reports. Yep. And it will pop up a little, you know, in, in the browser and you can just click on the individual reports. This one, this one, this one. It's yeah. not fancy, but it's better than <laughs> it's, it's manually doing everything. Understood, yeah. yeah. John Yas, I think maybe take a note that we need to do a video on reports. Uh, I've already had several people tell me that, that you're YouTube famous now and that they really like your videos. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, we used to have OBIS for a time to look at optimization histories. Is mm -hmm. there currently a optimization history viewing tool that there, uh, is being developed? There is one uh, that was that's been developed to work on the uh, Jupyter side, but I understand that not everybody uses Jupyter, um, and that OBIS is being refactored, and it's not going to support our, our uh, recording files anymore. You mean you mean OptView? Or sorry, Opt OBIS is our code. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, OptView is a tool developed at the University of Michigan. Right. Um, that is certainly something that we we should probably add is the ability to do that from outside of Jupyter and, and just just walk through your walk through your um, optimization history. But I have questions on how you think we should do that, so we should talk after. Uh, you know, later today. Anyone? All right. Oh, nope. one more. We're not done yet. Real quick. Um, thanks for the presentation. I was wondering, you brought up uh, build pipes parse. Mm -hmm. um, you're saying that the issue is mostly with IP opt? I think of the compilers that we've used, SNOPT has always been easy, you know, we generally, like, it's easy for us to have SNOPT uh, source files on our system and say this is where it is, go, and it doesn't have many dependencies. IPOPT has always been the one that is, like, you know, uh, go get mumps and, and whatever else that we depend on. Um, now that those things are available through Conda, I, I know that the latest version of our build pipes bar script does that, which has been very good. 
having just upgraded to the latest Mac architecture with an ARM chip, I've, you know, I've had to emulate the x86 side in order to get uh, PyOps parse or in order to get uh, IPOP to work. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to that, you know, eventually everything catching up with, with the ARM architecture. But that's, I, I think IPOPT uh, for us at NASA anyway has been the, the tool that we want to be easily available, basically a, a good SLSQP. <laughs> you know, it's a tool that everyone can have um, that respects sparsity and things like that. If you're still using SLS, SLSQP, you should try out IPOPT. Thank you. Uh, I'm a very recent uh, user of, uh, started using OpenMDAO very recently. I have a question about like your CI pipeline in terms mm -hmm. of when you go from one uh, version to another or when you make changes, how are you verifying that the optimizers are following the same trajectory or, or making sure that the there's no change in behavior. Can you talk a little bit more about your CI pipeline? Um, so on the OpenMDO side, most of the optimiz uh, the OpenMDO CI process, we, we strive for coverage, um, not to a ridiculous extent, um, but uh, you know, I, th I think we're hovering around 90% coverage uh, right now of, of the code base, and every time, uh, you know, someone someone submits a new capability or new feature, it doesn't get accepted without unit test. And those unit tests uh, on the OpenMDO side are usually, you know, if I, you know, posing this problem, do I get the same answer? We don't generally uh, check to see, did the optimizer take the same path to get here every time? Um, in my experience, it's difficult to do that. There's too much software that we don't control in that loop to be able to, to do that. On the Dymo side, I, I know, uh, Herb has just recently written a cap uh, or updated our capability to look at two trajectories and say, you know, is this trajectory, this previous trajectory, is it more or less the same as this trajectory to to varying levels of 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 fidelity? You know, here here's the trajectory I want, and essentially define a tube that this, this trajectory is flying through, and make sure that you know where, where I can tailor the, the the diameter of that tube and make sure that as we we update things, uh, the the solution that is ultimately arrived upon ag agrees with that. Because like you said, it's difficult. You can't necessarily say, you know, am I matching the final condition or anything like that. Um, so I think that uh, using using just Python's uh, unit test framework, we uh, or, uh, unit, unit test packages to define our unit test, uh, we've written a, a very good uh, parallel capable uh, test pro pro program called TestFlow uh, that, that runs through our tests for us. And then uh, where necessary, test flow. Yep. <laughs> and then where necessary, uh, where necessary, going through and, and having different asserts that assert, you know, like, am I am I seeing the same exact data in this recorded file out to you know n decimal places is is generally the sort of thing uh, that we look at. Uh, you see our, our normal CI pipeline, which is just unit tests, but we also have a nightly uh, build process that runs a much more complete and expensive regression test suite, um, which you don't see publicly because it's on a private internal server. But um, So I think the answer to your question is we run a pretty extensive regression test suite. Like Rob said, we don't verify the optimization path. Um, I'm not sure I personally think the optimization path is important if the answer it gets is the same to within some precise decimal. but. Um, I'm not talking about the trajectory itself, but the path the optimizer takes. Um, and like Rob said, that, that can be affected by a whole number of things. So really asserting that those are identical is, at least for us, not worth, I think, not worth the, the effort. But the, the benchmarks themselves and making sure that the physical optimization we get is the same within a high precision, say, 1E minus 5 or something, um, that's how we make sure that we haven't broken anything. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I didn't mention the benchmarking mode, but but we run... We run benchmarks on our own system so that we don't have to rely on on computers on GitHub.com that we don't know what their load, you know, how heavily loaded they are at any given time. And now we've reached a relative steady state in things, and and the benchmarking uh, performance lines are, are mostly horizontal. But every once in a while, we we see a tick up, or you know, this past year we saw a, a huge tick down when when we, Brett improved some of the coloring things, and and that was, you know, it's always happy to makes us happy to see that. Uh, 
Uh, Follow-up question was, are our benchmarks publicly available for people to run externally? Um, no, not currently, but I suppose we could make them available. They're in the code base. Oh, the benchmarks are there? I stand yep. corrected. Um, they're there. We'll reach out and we'll tell you how to find them. Um, if you're not using, if you are using TestFlow and you didn't know about the benchmarking stuff, uh, look it up in the docs. It's literally just dash B and it finds files with benchmark instead of test. Um, I will say, um, I think one thing OpenMDO does really, really well is our build pipeline um, and our testing is very, very comprehensive. Uh, so if you don't yet have a test suite, I would encourage you to follow that mold. It's pretty easy to follow how we set up CI and um, if you want to find out more about how we run our benchmarks, we can tell you that too. But I think that kind of process is pretty important for engineering software. So if you're not doing testing, start testing. And if you are doing testing, maybe look at what OpenMDO does to figure out how you could potentially do it better. I'm not going to say we're perfect. We're certainly not perfect, but I think we're very good. So uh, you mentioned for the building of Pi of Sparse that getting IPOP to work on ARM-based Max was difficult. Is there a reason why the Conda, because you mentioned you used Conda, so uh, the ARM-based Max have a Conda uh, package. Con Conda was telling me that there wasn't a, 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 compile, or a compatible version. If, I can't remember if it was Mumps or one of the other dependencies, um, maybe Metis. Um, and I've only tried the, <laughs> I've only tried this like about two weeks ago before I said okay whatever I'll I'll, I'll work around it for now. Um, but at the time I think it was telling me that there wasn't an architecture uh, available for for Metis uh, for me on on the on Conda Forge. Hey Rob, Manny Diaz from Marshall. Um, a lot of talk on optimizers. Wondering if you guys have thought about Pigmo integration or. Uh, just supporting Pigmo or any other global optimizer package. I I have not. Um, I I I think our focus has so been uh, you know we've been so focused on the gradient based optimization um, that and I've been trying to to you know to always keep abreast of of which ones of those are available. But I I see a lot of mention of Nitro, but I don't want to you know. Uh, we're probably not going to invest in the license for ourselves uh, here, so so it's unlikely that we that we develop that. And as far as the global optimizers go, it's 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 not something that has been a need that we have seen. But it, I mean, if if you have a need for it, and if if you have a solution, you know, if you think uh, Pigmo is the solution that you need, um, then that's something that we could look at. Um. There are two ways you can run OpenMDAO. You can make OpenMDAO the boss, um, in which case you want to use the driver interface. And there are some really nice things about the driver interface that I like personally, the ability to like, turn on and off design variables and scaling and constraints. Um, but, and there's actually code for this in our RevHack 2020 database. Uh, you can totally run OpenMDAO with the driver's natural, or sorry, the optimizer's natural API, uh, in which case you're just kind of using the problem to call run model and pull data in and out of it using the getval interface. Um, but that's totally fine. So if there's not a driver that supports what you want, um, at least as a, a workaround, you can just use the native API for your, your optimizer. Um, and then OpenMDO is just really like a black box to that optimizer. And especially if you don't need derivatives, there's really nothing wrong with that at all. Um, so you do not have to use OpenMDO's driver API if you do not want to, if you do not like it. Um, I, I think I know like NREL doesn't like the, or doesn't, I, you guys have an NL opt or something? John Yasa helped me out. There's another... Sorry, everybody. Hi, my name is John. I was a postdoc at NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab. We wrapped our own NL opt, like NL opt is a, is a package, but we wrapped it in OpenMDO as well as Dakota um, out of Sandia. And the way that we did it was instantiating our own driver class and then creating that out of OpenMDO. So it's a little bit more work, but it's much more native with OpenMDO that way. And you can use it um, the same as SLSQP, SciPy, PyOSparse, all those other ones. But uh, yeah, so. Obviously, you could write your own driver, or you can go without a driver interface. This issue has come up before about why we natively have support for PyOps Sparse, but not other optimizers. And I'll be blunt, the answer is that PyOps Sparse has the optimizers that we use here internally, and so there's like 
we're a lot lazy. of value. We're, we're lazy, and if somebody else is going to do the work for us, we'll yeah. happily take it. Um, <laughs> right, and so that, that, that API has a lot of value for us internally for the work we do. Um, that's not to say that we wouldn't accept a driver into the main repo from somebody else if they wanted to write it and maintain it, but we'd want like a pretty strong commitment for maintenance. And so I would probably suggest we, re we release that as like a standalone plugin package ahead of time. And then if it gets enough traction and there's a history of maintenance and maybe it comes into the main repo there, but just emphasize you do not have to use the driver interface. If, if a driver for your particular optimizer of choice doesn't exist, just step out of the driver interface. And, Frankly, that's possible even if you want derivatives. Uh, so the, the driver interface is not a strict requirement. I mean, in theory, we could have written OpenMDO without a driver interface. Uh, but it has some niceties for the way we do stuff. <laughs>